And hello, I'm Laura Lane at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. And I too welcome you to our webinar on strategies for reducing extreme economic inequality. And I want to thank all of the people you'll be seeing on the show and all of those who have helped put this session together. We hope this event will be informative and provocative for social workers in practice, in academia, and in school, and for our colleagues in other professions and disciplines. As Chris noted, this session is being taped and will be available in the future through the Grand Challenges website, which will be provided at the end of this webinar. Today's webinar will start with a welcome and introduction to all of our participants. And we hope that in addition to our panelists, all of you attending will feel free to ask questions and make comments through the Q&A box. I will provide first a very brief overview of the grand challenge of extreme economic inequality in the United States. However, this webinar is focused on solutions. Our first panel will explore possibilities for addressing inequalities in work and income, and our second panel will explore approaches to addressing deep inequalities in assets and wealth. And again, as Chris mentioned, we will save time at the end for questions and discussion. Next slide, please. The co-leaders of the Grand Challenge team working on economic equality are Jenny Romick from the University of Washington and Trina Shanks from the University of Michigan. I, Laura Lane, am also a co-leader and am a colleague of Trina's at the University of Michigan. Next slide, please. Our special guests who are joining us as panelists will be introduced in more detail by the panel moderators. They each bring expertise in ways of addressing the inequalities we have briefly outlined here. Next slide. Before we begin the core of our seminar, I want to provide a brief overview of the grand challenges and two indications of the problems of economic equality in the United States. The grand challenges for social work were initiated by the American Academy for Social Work and Social Welfare. They are a call to action to move forward, social progress powered by science, emphasizing research and evidence-based efforts and supporting social work's perspective of the person in the environment. By collaborating with individuals, community-based organizations, and professions from all fields and disciplines, we are working together to tackle some of our toughest social problems. Next slide. The Grand Challenges provide an opportunity for us to work together around a shared agenda to solve fundamental significant social problems. And through this work, we hope to improve society at the individual, the family, the community, and the national levels. This webinar is devoted to the 10th of the Grand Challenges, the challenge to reduce extreme economic inequality. And now for a little background. Next slide. The United States exceeds the degree of economic inequality when compared with some of the largest rich economies in the world, as measured by the Gini coefficient. This compares the poorest and richest members of the society. And as seen in this graph, the Gini coefficient of the United States at 0 0.36 is higher than that of the United Kingdom, Japan, Australia, Canada, Italy, Korea, France, Switzerland, and Germany. Next slide. The gap between rich and poor is evident in comparing the income gains between 1979 until just before the major recession at the beginning of this century. Gains in income for the top 1% of the population were 281% over this period. There was a 95% gain for the top 20% of the population, and that went down to a 16% gain for the lowest 20% of the population, a trend that has continued post-recession. Similarly, inequities mark the allocation of wealth in the country. As this map shows, the top 1% of our population owns a hugely disproportionate amount of the wealth, the assets and investments, while the bottom 40% own very little at all. Next slide. These are just a few markers of the nature of our problem. 
Now, however, we're going to look at some ways to address these problems. And remember again, we are planning time at the end of the webinar to take questions. You can submit your question at any time through the question and answer box, and please indicate to whom the question is addressed. Now, Jenny Romick from the University of Washington will moderate our first panel. Thank you, Laura. And um, Nicole and Amy, I hope you can log on and join us here. Um, thank you to all of you out there who have joined us today. Uh, as Laura said, I'm going to talk about strategies to reduce extreme economic inequality, strategies that are related to work, which is how most people get most of their income, um, and other income-based strategies. I have two panelists today who represent some cutting edge social work in this area. First, Nicole Valestero Keenan Lay is an MSW and the executive director of Puget Sound Sage in, in Seattle, Washington. Puget Sound Sage combines research, innovative public policy, and organizing to ensure that all people have an affordable place to live, a good job, a clean environment, and access to public transportation. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. Second, Amy Castro Baker, MSW and PhD, is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in their School of Social Policy and Practice. Dr. Castro Baker co-leads the research project associated with the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration, or SEED. SEED is led by Stockton Mayor Michael Tubbs, and it's a groundbreaking guaranteed income or basic income program that seeks to empower its recipients financially. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, good to be here. All right, um, I'll start with Nicole. Uh, Nicole, if you would, please describe your work and your organization. How does Puget Sound Sage work to reduce economic inequality? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think it's important to know about our organization is we try to move models at the local and regional level that can be duplicated or scaled in a sustainable, mindful way. Um, and I'll get into specifically what we do. Um, so we work on local and regional intersectional policies. Um, what that means specifically is easier to tell if I tell you a short story of our work. Um, so we actually started as a uh, labor, faith, and people of color coalition in 2007. Um, and our main focus was when new development was coming into Seattle uh, that we were going to advocate for community benefit agreements. So uh, Target was going to replace a goodwill um, in our international district where our office is located. And uh, we partnered with the Vietnamese small businesses around the site, uh, the laborers and uh, faith groups and ma many community groups to essentially get the building to be built by union workers and um, the new developer to come in that would create some economic benefit for the small businesses and the neighborhood as a whole. Then the recession hit and uh, the whole thing didn't get built. But out of it came an organization that continued to move from site fights, we went actually into um, labor standards, environmental justice policy, and um, equitable development policy. And a few of the things that we've moved, um, we do community-based participatory research to identify what community wants to see in their neighborhoods as it relates to economic inequality, good jobs, environmental justice, and equitable development. And then we advocate for those things at the city and the county and the state. Some of the things that we've um, advocated for and passed include uh, $15 minimum wage in SeaTac, $15 minimum wage in Seattle, um, a tax on Airbnb that established the only comprehensive anti-displacement fund in our region. And we uh, shaped a lot of the equity components of Initiative 1631, which was a cap and fee uh, climate bill that then went on to shape Jay Inslee's climate plan and now Elizabeth Warren's. Great. Um, when you do go out and, and take part in your, in your listening tours or your community-based participatory research, what are some issues that are coming up that, that people are talking about now that are kind of next steps for your organization? Um, we're getting kind of three main areas. One is around uh, the meaning of work. 
what does it mean to have a job when the traditional idea of jobs is dwindling um, and when those traditional jobs that are available to many more people um, just don't pay enough to pay the bills here in Seattle. Uh, so one is around just having a job and having meaningful work. Um, the second is around housing. Uh, a lot of people are being displaced out of the urban core. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of focus. And if you talk to most of the, we have um, labor unions on our board who represent about 100,000 different people across the state. And all of their members say their number one priority is housing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the other issue, um, which is, is more of a tangible and an existential threat is what are we going to do uh, around jobs and where we live as climate change happens. Great. All right, let's turn to Amy for a little bit and then we'll talk as a, as a, a work panel. Um, Amy, if you would, please describe SEED and what it hopes to accomplish. Yeah, totally. Um, there's a lot I could do to describe SEED. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to say um, a quick shout out to those who are organizing this. So there's a lot of interest right now in SEED, uh, both in the press um, and across a number of different disciplines. But my favorite thing about social workers is they're not content to just tell everybody how big and bad an economic problem is. They're ready to take risks and actually try and intervene, um, which is just to provide some framing, one of the things that I think is the most valuable thing about is a thread that runs through this whole webinar is not just saying, hey, the recession happened, inequality is out of control, uh, people's basic needs aren't being met, but what can we as a profession do about it from an empirical perspective? So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so thank you for organizing this. Um, so a little bit about SEED, um, you know, you can see there on the slide, nearly 40% of Americans can't afford a $400 emergency. That's not a news flash to anybody. Um, just in terms of providing some conceptual framing, you know, SEED is part of a broader range of experiments right now, conditional and unconditional cash transfers. Um, we are an unconditional cash transfer. Um, and what that means is that people are given cash, no strings attached, every month for 18 months. So our basic design is, you know, we randomly selected 125 households who were at or below the median income in the city of Stockton. Um, and they receive $500 a month, every month. Um, and they can use that money as they see fit. Um, there's no means testing. Um, there's, there's nobody following them to figure out whether or not they are following a, a specific set of rules. It is on a debit card. Um, and our goal is to see if we can smooth income volatility, what type of anxiety is reduced, um, what type of health outcomes are shifted, and then also um, a, a more important frame is what type of potential is unleashed in the community. Um, what type of hope or agency or self-efficacy do people have when we're removing that anxiety around income. Um, the other thing I should say that I didn't say at the very beginning is that, um, you know, none of this is coming out of tax dollars. So the $500 a month is being funded uh, primarily from the Economic Security Project and the research activities are being funded through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, so key piece of information there. The other thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is that the reason why Stockton is so salient for this particular experiment is because it is the, it used to be the foreclosure capital of the country. Um, so at the peak of the housing crisis, this is where subprime lending, predatory lending, um, all those types of uh, risky financial products are really being tested in Stockton. So we're trying a bold new anti-poverty initiative in the space and place that really represents, um, you know, kind of the, the, the place where foreclosure really took root. Okay, so uh, $500 a month is probably going to make a noticeable difference in people's income. Yes. Um, it's cool to hear about why Stockton. Uh, why the evaluation, Amy? What do you hope to achieve from that? And, and why is that important in terms of replicating this kind of work? Yeah, great question. So, you know, one thing about our design, and I, I won't uh, bore everybody on the webinar by going super in depth, uh, we're a mixed methods uh, research study. So when I say mixed methods, I mean, we have three specific pieces. So first we're an RCT. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, clear, I would imagine. The randomized control trial. Randomized control trial, yes. And that is paired with uh, semi-structured interviewing and then also with PAR, participatory action research. Mm -hmm. So the reason we're doing it that way um, is because we are intentionally trying to create a public discourse shift around the social contract, around the safety net, um, around what deservedness means. And we are 
leaning into that. So for that reason, we are um, kind of trying to talk to two different audiences at once. So we know that, uh, you know, within the policy community, within the empirical community, we're moved by evidence. So we're moved by effect size, we're moved by statistics. We wanna know whether or not our hypotheses are borne out, right? Um, but at the same time, we know that the public is not necessarily swayed by data. So um, we are also engaging in storytelling and narrative activities to try and create um, consensus building and evidence on the policy side for implementation, like what works and figuring out what it is if we were to scale it out, but then also at the same time, um, generating narrative shift and creating spaces for the public to have a conversation. So it's, it's both at the same time, we wanna figure out what works, um, to what degree, uh, because if we were to scale it out, what would implementation look like? Um, and without disrupting the existing safety net. So this is, I should be clear, because there's a lot of press around this, um, that we are not looking to see something like seed replacing the existing safety net. We see it as something that would work alongside. Okay, great, thank you. Um, it's interesting that both you and, and Nicole mentioned um, research as being part of your work. I mean, Amy, that was kind of a given for you, given that you're on the evaluation team. Um, but Nicole Sage both creates its own research and, and uses evidence to promote some of its strategies as well. Um, and we've also partnered with universities in the past to complete some of our research. So um, depending on the technical questions, we'll partner. Uh, we wanted to do a, a study of toxic exposure, for example, and we partnered with the University of Washington on that as it related to neighborhoods and work. Um, and so sometimes we'll lead it with community ourselves and we really believe in community driven research so we almost always have a steering committee um, but sometimes you have to you know you have a month to respond to something and you'll use census data <laughs> <laughs> that's fine I think yeah. everyone should participate in the upcoming census as well <laughs> uh, question for both amy and nicole uh, what's it like being a social worker doing this kind of work um, in the, this is clearly macro social work, but it's also an area where you have folks from different, uh, different professional backgrounds and um, different types of, of sectors involved. So what, what do you guys add as social workers? Mm -hmm. I've been called the emotional medic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of our work at times. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's both the, I'd say leadership in any form is 95% emotional labor and 5% vision. Um, and so a lot of what you end up doing, especially if you play a leadership role in movement work is kind of navigating the dynamics between groups of people, what people's core desires are um, and when you talk about making policy for social change and related to poverty, you're all, you were talking about people's core desires and needs. Um, and it gets really difficult to have a good conversation and come to some consensus when you're actively managing people's triggers in a policymaking setting. Um, and so I actually think that social workers have to be at the policy table because stressed out policymakers make stressed out policy. <laughs> I like the way you put that. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll cite you, but I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and what advice uh, would you to have for social work students who want to do this kind of work? Ooh, um, <laughs> I so so much. You know, one of the things I say to my students all the time. You know, they come in, you know, into my class with my policy courses and my social work courses. Um, just agitated. I mean, I just spoke with our entire MSW cohort the other night and I said, raise your hand if you feel like you came to social work school because everything's okay. You know, <laughs> you know, not surprisingly, the room, the room was quiet. You know, people don't choose to be social workers because they felt like 2016 was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, they choose to be social workers because they feel as though something is broken and they have a role to play either empirically or in practice in alleviating that and being part of change, at least trying, right? Um, and so, you know, just want to honor that. And so when we're, we're talking about something like guaranteed income or UBI, it's extraordinarily risky. Um, you know, I'll be the first to admit, and I, I do talk about this pretty regularly, as does my co-PI, uh, Stacia Martin West, is that this is a risky project. Um, a lot is going to go wrong. Um, giving people cash 
um, is fundamentally disruptive to the idea of deservedness. It's fundamentally disruptive to our idea of, um, you know, I would argue goes against the code of ethics of saying this, you know, Puritan work ethic that people don't deserve basic human dignity. And so when you're putting yourself at the center, you need an anchor. Um, and social workers belong at that table uh, because we are driven by the social work code of ethics. And so for, for social workers that are interested in going into any type of economic justice work, I would say doing some really um, intentional, not just self-care, but self-interrogation around how the social work code of ethics informs your seat at that policy table or that, um, that research table. You, you can't go into it without it because the, the risk will swallow you otherwise. Um, and if you're going to jump out and, and put yourself out there, you need to know what you're standing on. Um, so that, that sound, probably sounds a little bit nebulous, um, but I think that, you know, I work with people in economics, I work with people in the business world, I work with people in the policy space, the political space, you know, but social workers are the ones who come to the table with an anchor of dignity, an anchor of justice. So like knowing that that's, who you are and owning it uh, is really key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nicole, do you have something to add there? Um, I, I love everything you said. Um, and I think the only thing I would say is pace yourself. You don't have to do it all at the same time. Um, and if you try to do it all at the same time, you'll burn out by 35. That's <laughs> uh, <laughs> true, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess the other piece of advice I would have for people who want to do this work um, is like soak up the learning you can get from the most challenging people and the most challenging situations. Um, there's a lot, especially for social workers, um, if you have a grounding in kind of reading a room or moving a group of people towards agreement on something, um, there's so much to learn about different perspectives with people that really make you angry and a lot to learn about yourself in that process too. And so like, instead of immediately, um, you know, dismissing what makes you the most angry, I would dive right for it and figure out what is there um, so that you can like learn something really important to get to the next stage of the work that you need to do. That's great advice. Yes, that is excellent, excellent advice because you, you will get angry. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I, I thank you for that perspective, Nicole. Um, and Amy, for both of you, I think this was about working for economic justice, but broader, it's about how to do very difficult work in this world. So thank you both. I hope you can hang on for the Q&A session in a little bit. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand our program over uh, to my colleague, Trina Shanks. Uh, Trina is a co-lead of this Grand Challenge, and she is also an associate professor at the University of Michigan. And Trina will introduce our next two panelists who are focusing on inclusive asset building. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and thanks for that awesome conversation on work and income. Um, so. I lead the, the kind of branch of this grand challenge on inclusive asset building. So you saw from the data that Laura talked about that wealth is even more inequitable and more extreme with the benefits accruing toward the top than income is. And so my wonderful panelists will talk a little bit about the work they do in inclusive asset building. So I will welcome Jody and Reed to uh, the conversation. And just to give a little bit of a, a background on both of them, Jody Chan Blaylock um, has a master in public administration from the University of Chicago and a BSW from the University of Central Florida. And she currently is project manager for financial equity at Heartland Alliance in Chicago, Illinois. So welcome, Jody. Um, and then Reed Kramer has a PhD in public policy from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's in city and regional planning from Pratt Institute. Um, and he is currently at New America Foundation in Washington, D.C. So welcome, Reed. And so what I've asked both of them to do is to take a few minutes to introduce themselves and their organizations, and then to talk about a very specific um, set of work that they've been um, doing in the recent past. So I will invite Jody to talk a little bit about Heartland um, Alliance and what she does in Chicago. Jody. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Trina. And thank you um, 
to everyone on this panel, this is like such an inspiring group of people already. And um, it was so great um, to hear from you all, Amy and Nicole, and we're really um, excited about the work that's going on, um, especially at the Stockton um, Basic Income Pilot. So really, really great to hear and, and cool to see social workers doing all these things. So. Um, so thanks for having me. I um, lead our financial justice policy here at Heartland Alliance. Um, at Heartland Alliance, we are really um, fighting for a world um, where there's opportunity and equity for everyone. Um, and we do that work in a lot of different ways. Um, but for me, I, I really focus on financial justice or financial equity, building equity in our economic system. We know that our economic system is not working for for most people, um, as we've already been talking about in this webinar. Um, and one of the ways that, um, that we do that is through our asset building work. Um, as part of that, I lead a, a coalition called the Illinois Asset Building Group. So we're really working um, in the state of Illinois. Um, and if you could go to that next slide, um, it really frames a lot of the, the things that we're thinking about here in this body of work. So, um, so you can sort of see there, I won't, I won't read, <laughs> read it to you, but um, you know, again, none of this is gonna come as a surprise to anyone here, um, but we see, um, it, it, this, what I think this slide really breaks down is the difference between income and assets. So there is, um, you know, we have huge disparities in income and so really exciting to see the different ways that basic income and other innovations are, are starting to think about how to level the income playing field. But um, there's also a huge, huge gaps on the asset side. And so um, you can see here, that um, more than a third of, of people in Illinois um, are in liquid asset poverty, which means that they don't have enough liquid assets to survive um, at the, just at the poverty, poverty level for three months um, if they lost their source of income, um, sort of hearkening back to um, Amy's, you know, 40% of, of Americans don't have $400, right? So um, we know that, that people's, you know, everyone's savings cushion is just so, so, um, so thin. Um, and so that's one of the things we're really thinking about here. Um, and if you go to the next slide, the other frame for our work is really thinking about um, the racial wealth divide. And so thinking about a racial equity lens um, on our asset building work. And so you can see here, these, um, this data is just um, for Illinois, um, but you can see the vast disparity in wealth between white households, Hispanic households and black households. And so when we um, start to think about solutions on the asset building side, we really wanna have this as <laughs> like a guiding um, statistic for us thinking about how we address um, this gap. And so if you go to the final slide, it, it sort of gives you a sense of some of the policies that we work on, some of the solutions we work on in this, um, in the asset building space. Um, a little bit later, I'll dive into children's savings accounts specifically but we also do a lot on retirement savings. Um, more and more we're thinking about emergency savings, which isn't on here, but I think that's a big piece of the puzzle. Um, and we do a lot on the wealth stripping side. Um, so any financial products or practices that are actively stripping wealth um, from folks, which we really saw um, at play in the Great Recession. Um, so thinking about fines, fees, debt collection, um, predatory lending of different kinds. And so, um, and all of this is really with the goal of helping everyone build the assets and wealth that they need um, to live um, a full life, um, sort of across their lifespan. So that's a little, little taste of our work, but i um, excited to dive in more. Thank you, Jody. Um, and, and Reed, if you'll take a couple of minutes to talk about your organization, the work that you do at New America. Yeah. So um, I uh, work at the, a DC policy think tank called New America. So we're kind of here inside the beltway, the, the belly of the beast here in DC. And um, we're trying to engage policymakers and the general public to bring some attention to some of the contemporary challenges in, in the social policy space and we try to critique existing policies, look at the data, look at the trends, and then incubate ideas that can identify, you know, some solutions and, and policy reforms. And I was uh, a longtime director of our asset building program, 
uh, which was looking at how to help people in the middle and the bottom, you know, build up wealth, looking at an alternative to an income lens uh, and all the ways that assets matter and then what some of the policy ideas are. And so when I started this work uh, years ago, looking at some of the issues that had been really picked up by places like Heartland in, in uh, Illinois and building out kind of a policy agenda that could be implemented at the federal level, but also when we've had uh, obstacles there, uh, people at the state and municipal level of government have kind of picked up the pace, both things like children's savings accounts, like uh, ways of reforming public assistance rules to make it easier to, to get on, uh, ways of connecting more people to retirement savings plans. So that's um, been kind of my work over a, a career here in DC. Uh, recently, I've been leading something called uh, our Millennials Initiative, which is actually looking at some of the trends in wealth inequality, but from a generational lens. And we've really seen dramatic uh, trends unfolding. Um, and I've actually just finished a manuscript that's going to be published online at the end of October, which everybody can access uh, from the New America website called the Emerging Millennial Wealth Gap. And it's really um, showing some of the trends that, that inequality, uh, as it's unfolding with wealth, it's not just, uh, yeah, those at the top. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a generational lens too. Younger households are behind previous generations where they were at the same age. And they're also uh, significantly lagging behind older households in the years since the recession and the recovery. So a lot of policy implications to that, that uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about soon. Thank you, Reed. Thank you. Now, Jody, please tell us about the successes you've had in Illinois around child savings accounts and also some of the challenges and barriers to actually making it work on the ground. Yes, definitely. So, um, yeah, so we um, just recently um, were able to pass legislation creating a children's savings account program here in Illinois, which we are so excited about. Um, but I'm actually going to start by just describing, giving sort of an overview of children's savings accounts or CSAs in general, and then kind of um, tunnel down to, to what's going on in Illinois. Um, so children's savings accounts are, are long-term savings accounts usually opened um, at birth or at kindergarten um, with the aim of being used for post-secondary education. I may use college here, but really we mean college in a broad sense, so any post-secondary. Um, and right now there are more than 50, 65 CSA programs across the country um, at various levels, at the city level, at the county level, at the state level. Um, and so they say, you know, if you've seen one CSA program, then you've seen one CSA program. So they really all look a little bit different um, with some slightly different goals. But in general, um, CSAs aim to help children and youth build assets, specifically for post-secondary education, and one of the goals being to increase um, attainment of post-secondary education. So thinking about helping, putting kids on a trajectory um, from an early age to access um, college or post-secondary education. So, um, and I want to be like really clear because um, around sort of children's savings accounts and the racial wealth divide because there have been a lot of discussions around this and I think, um, you know, children's savings accounts are not going to be the thing that closes the racial wealth divide. And so I just want to like say that. <laughs> um, but we do believe that they can be a tool to increasing equity, um, particularly when we're thinking about college attainment um, and, and helping build family savings. Um, and so, um, but in order to do that, I think um, you really have to think about equity and put equity at the center of um, when you're designing CSA programs. And so we think about um, four key um, sort of features um, when we want to build an inclusive um, children's savings account program. So one, and, and really these can apply to almost any asset building program. So one is being universal. So making sure it's inclusive of everyone, truly everyone <laughs> um, in your geographic area. Um, automatic. So we try to make savings programs that happen automatically, um, which makes it really accessible for, for everyone. Um, then we try to think about making um, 
making CSAs progressive, um, so targeting resources um, at the folks who need it the most. Um, so thinking about low-income families, communities of color, and um, deploying resources um, in those directions. Um, and I think that's really where you start to get at equity um, in these programs. And then the last piece is making sure these programs are community driven. So when you are, you know, as you're starting to build a CSA program, making sure there are community stakeholders um, really driving that process um, and from the very beginning um, and saying what they want and what would work for them in a CSA program. So with those things in mind, I want to tell you a little bit about what's happening in Illinois. So we have been working for 10 years <laughs> to um, create a statewide CSA program. Um, and so, you know, that campaign has taken many forms over the years, but we are excited that this year we worked with our state treasurer's office to finally pass legislation, which you see on the slide. Um, and so beginning in 2021, every child born or adopted in Illinois will have a $50 seed deposit put into a 529 college savings account in their name. Um, and so um, when we think about this though, um, sort of getting Trina to what you asked about how this looks on the ground, you know, this, this setup only hits at a couple of those goals that I mentioned before. So this is universal and it's automatic, but there is nothing in there that really, um, makes it an equitable, equitable program that's really targeting lower income families or um, kind of directing deposits towards low income families. And so um, that's really where um, implementation is really important. So passing legislation is one thing, but then there's a whole bunch that gets worked out on the implementation side. And we are just at the beginning of that. Um, but our goal is for the community and for communities across Illinois to create additional features to the CSA program that will make it equitable. So things like additional deposits for low income families, or um, additional deposits for schools that are predominantly kids of color, or um, a progressive um, match savings um, program, things like that, um, but really uh, driven by the community. So, um, so that was a lot of information. I'm happy to kind of go back and forth more on it, but um, we're really, really excited um, uh, to, to finally get this done. So. Well, I just have one follow up question before we turn it back over to Reed. Um, you talked about it being community driven and having stakeholders involved. Do you now, now that the bill has been passed, do you have a communication strategy or a way to make sure that community based participants, teachers at schools, churches, I don't know all the constituents you might um, be targeting, but kind of understand the bill and work and advocate for some of these equitable things you're talking about? And MSW could play a role in that too, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. Um, so I sort of alluded to this with, with talking about how CSAs should really be community driven, but CSAs work best when it's really woven into the fabric of communities. So when teachers know about it, when school administrators know about it, um, Promise Indiana is a CSA program that always gives an example of like the dentist will like deposit five dollars into a kid's account when they visit the dentist like when the whole community is rallying behind the kids. Um, we really are just at the very beginning of this. The governor signed the legislation last month. Um, and so, so a lot of this is still in process, but I will say that um, one, it's really important to have a working relationship with um, whoever's administering the program, and we do. The state treasurer's office is a great partner in this. They will be administering the program and we're working closely with them. The second thing is that, um, you know, as we've been working on this campaign for 10 years, we've had a number of stakeholders at that table, including low-income parents, including um, early childhood um, stakeholders, um, and a number of others. And so all of those groups, we are continuing to meet together to figure out what are our priorities um, and to figure out ways we can engage other stakeholders kind of as we're entering into a new phase of the work. Well, thank you, Jody. It sounds like yeah. you're doing exciting work and still have a lot ahead of you. <laughs> yes. Um, so Reed, I'm going to transition back to you and thank tell us you. a little bit more about your Melito project and how you've been working at New America. Yeah. So 
I think we, we do know that, that we've looked at wealth inequality and there is a kind of a generational story to be told here. Um, this slide kind of gives you a little more indication of kind of the wealth uh, uh, concentration that we've had, wealth inequality. The, the, the middle column is from 1992 and then the other column is from 2016. So you see the top 10% is really taking up an increasing uh, disproportionate to the share of the population. So that, that's where the trend uh, has been. And we often look at wealth, uh, I mean, we often look at inequality through income and, and you know, wealth is just an important uh, frame uh, and it's very consequential and uh, it's really been dramatic to see the, the, the change. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see some data that, that really just shows the, the changing fortunes of the different households. And from 1989 to 2016, um, basically, if the younger household's wealth story has kind of been pretty flat, even uh, a little uh, lag, um, but older households at the typical median level uh, have done quite, quite well. So this is really the, the generational wealth gap, the millennial wealth gap that, that has uh, emerged since the recession. And the oldest households now are kind of among the, the wealthiest in, in US history and, and maybe human history, given how prosperous America is uh, on the planet. So there's a lot of analysis that we're kind of trying to disaggregate and, and break down um, by different groups. Um, obviously, race and ethnicity play a huge role and are associated with a lot of different kinds of uh, outcomes and, and disparities. Um, and uh, yeah, going to the, the next slide, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the assessment after looking at a lot of the, the, the data and the finances and the breaking down the components of wealth and net worth is that the, book, the balance sheet of millennials as a generation, looking at all the different components, it, it's a pretty poor, weak balance sheet. Um, there's low savings. There's been rising levels of debt that have shifted from traditionally mortgages start to show up for young adults in their young 30s, mid 30s. Uh, and we know that fewer of those are showing up, but a lot more debt, student debt, student loan debt is really the big part of the big story. There's other kinds of consumer debt, um, fees and fines, credit cards, vehicles that are also part of the balance sheet and uh, the changing role of housing. So the home ownership rate is down significantly for younger households as well. And that's what's reflected over there uh, on the right. And often the, the research kind of showed that, you know, if you just looked at the home ownership rate, it's kind of like a million, a million point three fewer households that we might expect to be homeowners. And since housing equity is a significant portion of the balance sheet when people do accumulate wealth. It's a big part of the story. So that tells a lot of potential wealth that's not there. But also, uh, given the poor balance sheet, there's just fewer uh, families that are forming, independent households that are forming. And that's a whole other, in fact, that greatly exceeds the families that aren't showing up because of their, their not of the home ownership rate. And there's probably another three and a half million households that haven't even been formed that we would have expected if we looked at past trends. So that's a lot of kind of potential wealth that's not being accumulated by young adults. And, uh, and I think it's really going to have severe implications for social policy. So, you know, what we're trying to do with this project is look at the family finances, look at the balance sheet you know, wealth matters. And so we've got to break it down into the different elements of savings and debt and, and other kinds of assets and, and, and what the role of housing uh, can be. Um, so some of the policy ideas are to respond to ways that we can encourage savings at the uh, household level. And that includes access to basic financial services, that includes, you know, like bank accounts and making sure that they have good fee structures and making sure that there's oversight and regulation of the financial services marketplace so that people aren't ripped off and uh, assets aren't just stripped away from families uh, needlessly. Um, and other kinds of issues now of debt. Um, so there's a lot of new work around how to deal with kind of the debt load, the debt overhang that's looking at 
uh, you know, facing a lot of the families and, and young adults. So there's a number of proposals or specifically around student loans and student debt that are getting a lot of consideration now that are incubating, that are being part of the presidential campaign and conversation. And, you know, the challenge there is that it's, it's a large uh, set of households that are affected. The numbers are big. Um, there's a difference between people that might be distressed and have a hard time paying back their loans, but uh, everybody, uh, so, or do you, can you figure out ways of targeting, reaching those people specifically, or there could be a rationale for kind of trying to wipe out in one felt swoop, large, you know, tranche of, of student loan uh, debt. Um, so those are some of the, 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 issue areas and, and, and around savings, I, I'll just say here to, to kind of pivot and, and kind of end my time that, you know, we, we look a lot at different tax policy uh, structures that are, that, are, that are set up. I mean, that's a real tool for encouraging kind of financial uh, behavior. And right now the system is set up quite regressively where you have wealth, you actually have the benefit of a lot of access of, of different subsidies. And when you have less, it's harder to, to have, um, to access those and you know what are some of the ways that we could create accessible incentives to save for people at the bottom whether it's a match on savings that are in, in, in at, at low levels whether it's a forgiveness of tax right now if you put money in a savings account and it generates interest you're taxed on that interest even if you're a, a low-income family if you're a small saver um, what are some of the ways you know, we possibly could try to come up with some tax-free savings the tax filing process is a big tool. We have the earned income tax credit right now already on the books that uses the tax filing process and it's a refundable credit. And there could be ways of um, maybe strengthening that program, maybe increasing it for families that have children. Uh, because a lot of these issues are stressing families out where they're, maybe they're not forming households, but they're also, it's harder to raise children. It's harder to meet your responsibilities of care and caregiving. And that's increasingly falling on the millennial population as they age, both raising kids, but also now taking care of elders. And if there's fewer resources in the, in the households, well, it's going to be a real, a real stress. And that's a problem for, for, for us all. So anyway, this publication that I'm trying to get uh, through the, to the finish line that'll be out in the end of October, we'll have some more, more detailed policy ideas and, and a lot of facts and figures. So I'll um, look forward to, to sharing that when it's ready to roll. Thank you so much, Reed. And so hopefully with this conversation and this panel, you guys see that there's so many possibilities in the inclusive asset building field. So hopefully you will continue to engage with us on these issues. But right now I will turn it over to Laura and she will um, handle questions from the audience. Oh, thank you so much to all of us. Laura, are you there? We uh, look like we may have lost your, looks like your screen may have frozen. Rose. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Hit, hit mute and unmute and that might reset it. This is Amy. Thanks, Amy. You know, while we're working to get Laura up online, I can go ahead and ask the first question that came in. It was a question for Amy Baker and it came from Kara Graymore and I apologize Kara, if I'm butchering your name there. Um, but the question was about seed and universal basic income overall. And paraphrasing it, uh, her question was, I've, I've seen over time that capitalism has found ways to undermine gains in income and leave the population that had made gains back where they were uh, before it happened. For instance, in her lifetime, she's seen a fight for $7 an hour and now the fight for $15 an hour in major metro areas. And these are still places where people making the new higher minimum wage can't um, afford housing or can't support, afford basic needs. Um, and so the, the question is, is there work being done at SEED or anywhere else that looks at ways to prevent this sort of thing from happening? Specifically, proposals to provide basic needs such as housing and food in addition to or in place of um, basic income? 
a, it's a really good question. That was a, a, a thick one. Uh, <laughs> there, there's, so, so first, the first thing I'd say is that, you know, we didn't get to this place of inequality through one policy failure or one problem, you know, overnight. So we're talking about, you know, the inequality of the past showing up as inequality in the present, right? So in, you know, all that to say there is no panacea for the extractive logic of capitalism, which is how our system has been built from the very beginning, right? So it's going to take things like child savings development accounts alongside things like guaranteed income and housing protections, right? So, you know, in terms of, you know, one project that's taking them all on, I can't name one, right? Because there's not one project that can resolve it. What it takes is social workers and scientists and policymakers working with the public across silos in order to re-knit the economy and re-knit the social safety net. So that's kind of like the, the 10,000 foot view answer. Um, specifically to see the two things that I just want to note is that, you know, first, like we're really upfront in saying that we do not expect to see major changes in um, housing cost burden. You know, $500 a month is not going to significantly alleviate housing burden for anybody anywhere in the country. I, I mean, they're just not, unless they're doubling up or tripling up, right? So we know that there's some um, intervention limits and even some empiric limits when we're talking about cash. Um, second, you know, we got a lot of pushback, I'll just own, when we designed this project about providing people with cash without also providing financial coaching or financial capability or other types of, you know, training, you know, et cetera. The reason we're so firm on cash is that we need to see first um, how spending the money impacts people's well-being before we start pairing it with other types of interventions. So the idea here is to say, we're going to isolate this one thing and figure out how it smooths income volatility, how it does or does not alleviate, you know, public health problems, right? And then scaling it up and scaling it out. So if we think back to TANF, for instance, you know, one of the ways that, one of the ways that TANF failed in many ways is by not figuring out what had to happen in terms of implementation. So what we're able to do as a small experiment is say, what are the bureaucratic structures that need to be in place if we were to scale out a guaranteed income across a whole city or across a whole county, you know, that type of thing. So we're really focusing, you know, on that in isolation to see how it works in conjunction with housing, with asset building, you know, with all of the other types of pieces. Thank you, Amy. Uh, it seems like Laura's still still away, so I, I will ask the Can next you hear question. Me now? I should be oh, back. There we go. Okay. Back. Okay. Welcome back, Laura. We're glad to see Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I my uh this wing of the building lost its internet for a few minutes there oh gracious yes. yeah so it, stop me if i ask a question that you've already talked about um you wanted to ask um in what ways does uh and this is mostly for the asset building how do different wealth wealth stripping kinds of predatory practices affect the kinds of programs that you're both uh dealing with Um, I can take a crack at that. Um, so, and I may also loop in, I saw a question came in as well about, um, uh, you know, what will it take for other states to pass CSA programs? So I may um, jump ahead and answer that one too. But um, so on the predatory um, side, that is like a huge piece of the equation. So thinking about Amy's comments about how to like, a, to address economic inequality, it is going to take a host of policies and solutions. There's no one thing. That is absolutely one of the things we need to think about. Um, because we, what's going to, you know, otherwise what happens is we're going to put money in, in folks' pockets, and then it's going to be like stripped right away through um, any number of things, like fines and fees that add up, through um, payday loans, if so, if so say we, we boost income, but folks still don't have a, a strong enough emergency um, savings cushion, then when a financial crisis arises, maybe they take out a payday loan and then they, they get right back in a hole. So um, it's absolutely one of the, the pieces of the puzzle that we need to think about. Um, particularly, I would say, um, predatory payday loans and title loans and things like that. But we also see some of those concerning features in all sorts of financial products, including things like overdraft fees and basic checking accounts. So you could really find um, some of those practices across the board. Um, on the, um, the question that came through about 
what it will take for other states to pass CSAs. One, so there are a number of other states that have passed CSAs, CSA legislation recently, um, which has been really exciting. And I think um, the, the field, the CSA field is really gaining momentum. And I think, um, you know, what it will take. And I think the, the, the best thing for, for the best way for it to happen is by advocates, community groups to be pushing for it because we can have, you know, state treasurers or political leaders champion this and that's a good thing. But the, the problem with that is when they leave, maybe the political will for the program leaves with them. It's really best for CSA programs to be pushed by the community and sustained by the community. And so um, I think my hope would be that, that groups would come together, local groups in other states um, to push similar legislation. And, and there are tons of folks in the field who would be happy to help with that. Thank you. I see that we are just about uh, done with our time on this webinar. Does anyone have they want to make uh, or question to leave us to pondering? Laura, I think we missed the first part of your question. Could you just repeat that real quick? Sure. I was just saying we're just about at the end of our time here, and I was wondering if anyone had a last burning statement to make or a question they wanted to leave us pondering? Um, I guess I have something. <laughs> so, you know, as I, for probably the last 10 years, I've been an advocate on policy change um, in one form or another. And having gotten to see the, the things that I worked on implemented and passed, um, I'm squarely back at the place I started, uh, which is we aren't going to have effective policy change without effective culture change. And I think social workers play a really important role in shaping culture. Um, what are the underlying values by which we move a policy, by which we implement it? How do we value the people who are involved in every stage? And social workers do that thinking that, um, you know, I'm finding people from other fields don't always do that thinking. Um, and so, you know, if we have a role to play to end income inequality, yes, we can do it with individual people and that matters a lot because that changes culture. But if you're changing policy, um, I think organizing with the people who are doing that to make sure you're solid and grounded and connected um, is going to be one of the most important things. So, you know, you can have a great idea, but you have to get the political will to move it. So reiterating what you said in a different way. <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you. This has been a really fascinating and inspiring um, set of presentations. I'm going to turn us back to Chris now uh, for a couple of last comments. Actually, uh, this is John. I'm going to take it, take over for uh, for Chris here. Um, there are a, uh, a number of ways that. Uh, folks can get involved with the Grand Challenges for Social Work. Uh, you can see the slide here. There are, whether you're a dean and director, a practitioner, advocate, policymaker, student, faculty member, uh, researcher, or funder, uh, there are uh, a, n a number of ways for you to, um, to, to, to join with us. Uh, the, perhaps the simplest way are to, to, to take a look at the, our, uh, our, our website at uh, um, uh, at www.grandchallengesforsocialwork.org. Um, there you can find uh, the particular ways of getting involved, including joining our Facebook group, liking our Facebook page, following us on Twitter, uh, and particularly contacting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the 12, one of the, the leadership of the 12 networks, including um, the folks here on the phone um, today to join in this work, this is critically important work, to uh, address this grand challenge to, uh, to reduce uh, economic uh, uh, inequality. So um, uh, on behalf of the Grand Challenges for Social Work, we wanna thank everybody for, for joining us today. And uh, again, the, the, uh, the uh, presentation will be on, um, uh, will be on, the, uh, on the website at grandchallengesforsocialwork.org. And uh, you'll shortly, as the slide suggests, you'll receive a, an email with the co-lead contact information and a link to the recording in the website. 
and um, we'll also ask you to to uh, to take a very short survey about the webinar so that we can be uh, we can improve these as uh, as we go forward. But uh, I want to thank uh, again on behalf of, of the Grand Challenge for Social Work all of our uh, panels today um, and our moderator Laura Lane to for for uh, for taking us through uh, and and we trust that we will see you next time uh, uh, as these series of webinars continue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye. All right. So.